in this video, we will be reviewing a minimalist formula sheet as we prepare for future MAS1 settings. Let's get started. Hello everyone, thanks for joining me today. I want to start off by saying if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. Be sure to catch future videos and lets me know that this channel is worth continuing. So with that said, I uh, also want to add that I have created a Quizlet, uh, so look to the description of this video for a link, as well as the password is just the name of this channel, The Actuarial Data Scientist, uh, capitalization of the first word, um, sorry, the first letter of each word. Uh, I created this because I feel like we can kind of crowdsource a, a Quizlet booklet. I think that would be helpful for most as well as myself. I created the minimum two note cards because I'm counting these videos as my contribution. Uh, and if no one's interested in doing this, that's fine, but thought I'd throw it out there and see if we could all work together and maybe create a nice uh, database of useful note cards. With that said, I'll jump into the video. Uh, so that is my formula sheet. So this is, as I went through past exams, uh, similar to how I style these videos and I ask or start everything off by saying what are the core concepts or formulas that you need to know before you can even approach the problem and I had those all listed out for all the previous questions I haven't made all the videos yet um, and I just compiled that all together I will say some of them are missing because if it's something that I knew like the back of my hand I didn't think to write it down as I was studying for myself selfishly uh, so I apologize for that if some concepts aren't included, but I feel like this is a fairly exhaustive list. Uh, and again, this is a minimalist approach. So um, if you know everything I've listed here, 100%, but nothing else, you might only get a six or a seven on the exam. So this isn't meant to be all the material. So don't think if you know all of this, you're totally set. This is just meant to be most bang for your buck. Uh, this is the bare minimum you need to know and, and you might be able to do uh, all right on the exam. So with that said, we'll go ahead and get started and you see all the chapters on the left that we're going to go through um, eventually as I scroll on through. So first off, distribution. So this is just things that correspond primarily to Poisson and Exponential, but there's a few other things. So uh, first off, just notation wise, uh, the difference between lambda and theta for Exponential and Poisson distribution and how they relate is important to understand. Um, second, I also have a video out on this already that uh, if you have a non-homogeneous <laughs> non lambda um, and you're interested in the frequency over that given time period, if you just take the average frequency over that time, you can then treat it as a homogeneous uh, Poisson process. Next bullet point, uh, if you have the sum of uh, independent but identically distributed exponentials. That's equivalent to gamma with the same corresponding theta, and then that second parameter is just n. Uh, obviously, <laughs> variance, this is something you should know from p, uh, but the variance of x equals the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. Um, also, I should have said this earlier that um, unlike my other videos where I try to prove a decent amount of what I'm claiming, this video is really just meant to give you the formulas. Uh, you know, it's two days before the exam, so I, I know we care more about just what do I need to know, what do I need to have memorized. Uh, we, we might <laughs> be in crunch time if you're you're watching this video. So, just going through the formulas we need, but be sure to check out my other videos on these same topics uh, if you want to get more into why these formulas are the case. Next, the variance of a compound frequency severity, so that if you have two different distributions you're sampling from, one for the frequency and one for the severity, this is the formula for calculating the variance of that compound distribution. Next, you need to know exponential distribution is memoryless and how that applies to deductibles. Uh, we also have, if you have two Poisson processes, uh, if you know that a claim occurred uh, but you don't know from which one and you have their corresponding lambdas, uh, this is the probability that it, it came from the A distribution as opposed to B. Um, so 
Next, we have uniform. So uniform is just the beta distribution where alpha and beta equal one. So you won't see uniform in your formula sheet, uh, or not formula sheet, the distribution sheet with the uh, life tables and whatnot. Um, you're not gonna see uniform anywhere because it's technically just a special case of the beta distribution. So I would recommend having the variance of the uniform distribution memorized. Uh, it hasn't shown up on, uh, I think this has only shown up once or twice. So it's not super important, but it has happened. Uh, but in case you don't feel like memorizing that, if you just know that uniform is beta with alpha equal one, beta equal one, then you should be good there. And then finally, exponential distribution uh, where there is a cap. So you know you have losses coming in and the insurance company only pays up to a certain limit. Um, if you want to take in a sample of paid out losses and then estimate theta, the distribution of uh, the uncapped losses. This is what it would be. It would just be the sum of the losses paid out divided by only the number of losses that were not capped. So let's say you have a $10,000 limit, uh, you have a $600 loss, a $1,000 loss, and then a $10,000 loss at the limit, uh, then you would only divide by two because only two of the three losses weren't capped. So that's it for this section. Next, life contingencies. Um, so not going to spend too much time on this. I uh, will put a link in the description uh, probably for all the videos that correspond to different sections that I have out. It's not going to be everything. Um, and I have a video where I walk through what all these different columns mean and how to interpret them with exception of this column. Uh, so if you know what this means or how to interpret it, please be sure to comment below uh, so you can educate me as well as the other people who watch this video. Um, but for all other columns, as well as uh, n to the p sub x and n to the q sub x, uh, all these notations uh, I have listed here or walked through in the other video. So definitely want to know those. Um, oh, something I was going to do, uh, so I'll go back up to distributions for a moment is the frequency of questions so life contingencies there is always a question where you're going to come to this table uh, i think in every exam it's you know there are two ages of interest and you have to do some kind of present value calculation that takes into consideration death rates um, and just definitely there's going to be one or maybe two just really easy softball life contingency questions um, <clears throat> probably only one and then you know maybe a few other harder ones uh, but I feel like this is pretty low-hanging fruit. If you just know what these columns mean, uh, you could probably work through those problems on the fly. Going back up to distributions, I apologize for not doing this earlier. Um, you need to know Poisson and exponential like the back of your hand. There are going to be multiple questions concerning those distributions. You should feel really comfortable with the PDFs and CDFs. Uh, this exponential gamma, I think that's only one question that it's shown up on in previous exams. So good to know, but you know you might not need to know this for any upcoming exam. Uh, you absolutely have to know the variance formula. This will definitely show up at least in one question. Uh, variance of frequency severity. Um, I think this is pretty much guaranteed to show up on at least two questions. And I think the reason for that is uh, the way they test this formula or, or compound frequency severity, they treat them as different sub questions right so they have here's a frequency here's a severity they'll have separately here's a compound Poisson and they think of that as being different when really you can just choose to think of it again as a frequency severity and then they also might get into some things with the Tweety distribution um, but really this is a nice catch-all for a lot of different questions if you know this formula and how to use it I'd say that's probably going to be two questions on the exam so definitely need to know this formula um, uh, memorylessness of exponential uh, so you definitely need to understand this concept it shows up on every exam I think I think there's only been one question that explicitly calls out uh, you have a memoryless distribution what's the mean given some cap uh, so fall 2019 question one is that um, but otherwise this is just a general concept you should understand but uh, only one or two previous exams had an explicit question on this, I think. Uh, likewise, this Poisson formula, I think that's only been on one or two previous exams, so not a definite 
appearance on following exams, but might show up. Um, I think uniform shows up pretty frequently, I'm not sure. And then uh, this, I think is only one or two past exams, one question. So good to know, but uh, when we eventually work through uh, the solution on this, when I make a video for it, uh, this is something you could work out on the fly using uh, a solid understanding of the maximum likelihood estimation, um, but definitely good to know this shortcut, although um, low probability we'll see this question, I'd say 50-50. Uh, and we already went through life contingencies, so now we're caught back up. Let's go through our survival analysis. Uh, so that is, what is the survival function? It's just 1 minus the CDF, uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's also the hazard function. So I have this listed because it appears in this equation, which you definitely need to know. Um, so just wanted us to understand what it was. Um, but I don't think I've seen this directly in past exams. But the hazard function is just the probability of dying divided by the number of people who survive up to that given point of interest. So it's the probability of dying in that exact moment is a way of thinking about it, even though that's not exactly right since it's continuous. Um, so that's what the hazard function is, and then you need to know that the survival function is equivalent to e to the negative integral of the hazard function um, for a given t. So I think this has shown up, in f I would say, 50% of past exams. So uh, another uh, equation that's not too difficult to remember and definitely recommend having this in your back pocket because again probably 50-50 chance of seeing this on a question uh, on a given exam. And finally expected lifetime uh, that's just taking the integral of the survival function across the entire domain and that will give you uh, the expected lifetime of the x variable of interest. And I don't know I think this only has shown up once um, explicitly. Um, next, AIC. So there's always going to be a table of like uh, you know different selection criteria. There's going to be at least one of those tables on the exam. So definitely want to know uh, you know whether you want to maximize or minimize AIC or R, R squared or whatever it may be, adjusted R squared. Um, so those types of things. This is more a note that I just found helpful. I, I don't think this has shown up, but just in case, in the book you're given that AIC equals uh, negative 2 log likelihood plus 2 times P, and I'm just adding that P is the number of moving parameters, which intercept is one of them. So if you have that one variable model plus an intercept, P would be 2. So just wanted to call that out. Uh, another thing is r squared is just equivalent to uh, 1 minus the sum of squared errors divided by the sum of squared um, errors of a model where you're just taking the average. I'm forgetting the term. <laughs> I know there's a specific letter I should use here, uh, but I'm, I'm forgetting, so I just put m. Um, but just visually, and if you had a single variable model, uh, this is how I kind of remember it. Um, so you just take the square distances of the blue lines and the green lines, uh, and I'm doing 1 minus that. Um, and that gets you the proportion of variation explained by your model. Definitely want to know how to calculate that. Uh, adjusted R squared, I think this has only shown up on one past exam. Uh, and just to clarify, I haven't gone through all the past exams in a few months. I've just been trying to work through the videos, so I could absolutely be wrong. This is just kind of my gut feeling. Feel free to comment below and tell me, uh, no, Taylor, that question shown up in every past exam, or uh, you know, the alternative if I get it wrong the other way. So please comment below so we can all benefit from each other's knowledge on what you think is going to show up on the exam and what's important to know and what's maybe less important. So here we just have adjusted R squared and. This is just something to have memorized, so again, maybe go to Quizlet and make a note card for this and help all of us remember that. Uh, again, deviance, another just memorize that 
the deviance is equal to 2 times the log likelihood of the saturated model, subtract the log likelihood of the fitted model. VIF is 1 over 1 minus r squared, so that's how I've learned it and know VIF, uh, where r squared is how good you can predict the x variable uh, that you want to know the VIF for when you use all other x variables to predict it. Um, there is one past question where they did this, uh, where you had to know this formula, I had never seen this before, um, where the variance of your beta of the x variable of interest in the full model divided by that same variance of that same x variable's beta but in a model where it's by itself. Um, so I don't, I still haven't walked through the proof of this or understand this, but this was a past question, so I just wrote it down. Uh, so this is something I have no idea why that's the case, uh, but it did show up on the previous exam. Next, we have bias. So I have no trouble remembering that bias is the difference between the expected value of your parameter and the truth. I do, however, mix up which one's subtracted by which and in the exam answers, you could have negative or positive values, and that can trip you up. Uh, I feel like they should just ask for the absolute value of the bias, so that's not important, but uh, I think this was important in one of the previous exams. So you definitely need to know bias, and I recommend making sure you know that it's the expected value that comes first. Next, uh, mean squared error. So I hope you know how to take the mean of the squared errors. Uh, but another way of writing it is that mean squared error is just the equivalent to the variance plus the bias squared. And next we have, and, and I think that's only shown up on uh, one or two past questions, but you definitely need to know uh, what mean squared error is as well as what bias and variance are. All of those will definitely show up in some capacity whether you need to know this formula or not. I think it's lower likelihood. Speaking of likelihood, we have method of moments and maximum likelihood estimation. So method of moments, you can think of it as saying, uh, take the expected value of x and set it equal to some function of the parameter of interest. Uh, and then you solve for theta, and that's how you get your theta hat. Or actually, it's uh, when you use method of moments, it's typically denoted theta tilde. And then maximum likelihood is when instead, for a given theta, you calculate the product of all the probabilities of your data and so you get the likelihood of seeing your data given an assumed theta. And then when you do that, you pick the theta that maximum maximizes the probability of seeing the data that you saw. So that's why it's called the maximum likelihood estimation. Next is the logit. Uh, and, and sorry, uh, definitely going to see a question on at least one, if not both of these, on any MAS1 setting, I think. Uh, so you definitely want to know both of these methods. Uh, logit, um, I'm pretty sure this is likely to show up on exam, but not 100%. Uh, but just, I typically, the reason I have this written down is I remember the log odds, and then when they ask for something like, you know, what's pi hat, I always have to, <laughs> by hand, solve that this is the relationship by taking the inverse link function. And I finally just wrote it down, so I, I need to memorize this. I always do the math and back into it, which is very slow. So I'd recommend memorizing this because it's probably going to show up. Uh, this next bullet point is just straight up uh, uh, one of the questions I haven't gone over yet, um, but just the difference between a confidence interval and a prediction interval. And the question that this is referencing, there's a third set of lines, which is just absolute nonsense. So I just took that out uh, since we're only interested in what we actually need to understand. <coughs> So here, um, the way that uh, you should think about this to kind of help you keep this straight is the prediction interval is, hey, for a given x, so let's say over here, uh, I want to be 95% sure that my prediction interval contains uh, the data point. And I might have tripped up on my words there and technically said that wrong. So I apologize if that's the case. But this is a long video, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so. Given that's the case, uh, I see the overall slope. I think it's going to be somewhere in this range. Um, whereas confidence interval, that's going to change based off of where I'm at. Because really, confidence interval is how confident am I that the mean is in a given range. Uh, and as I'm closer to the center, I'm going to be more confident so I can have smaller bands. Uh, 
but confidence is corresponding to the mean, whereas prediction interval corresponds to a given data point you're making a prediction about. And so that's why prediction interval is going to be wider and straight as opposed to confidence interval, which is going to be tighter, closer to the center of the distribution of the data that you're seeing. And then finally, uh, this totally random thing that I think was only on one previous exam, uh, which is the expected value of the order statistic of an exponential distribution is this mess. So uh, hopefully that doesn't show up, <laughs> is how I'm feeling about that type of question. Next, we have hat matrix math. So all this is is questions that, uh, similar to the selection-based method questions, you're just going to get a table of multiple matrix results, one of which will be uh, you know, just x transpose x, one's x transpose x inverse. You know, They give you all the different combinations. You need to know uh, what corresponds to what you care about. Uh, and I say it like that because sometimes you need to just know which one corresponds to the beta matrix or what have you. Um, but I would put money on there being at least one question where they ask for something that involves knowing uh, what is the hat matrix. So knowing that you have this matrix and you care about the diagonal values and then how to use that in calculating standardized residuals or calculating Cook's distance. Um, so I would expect one question on the exam uh, where this is of importance. Uh, another place it shows up is in, and I think this was just one previous exam, one question uh, where you needed to know, uh, again it's been a while so I'm not 100% on this, but you needed to know that you can um, know the leave one out cross validation mean squared error even though you only fit the model once. Uh, using the hat matrix diagonal values. Um, so that's what this formula is, is saying. There's a shortcut for calculating leave one out MSE um, in, in that case. But again, I would say high likelihood of at least one question on the exam where uh, you're using the hat matrix in some capacity. Next, we have statistical tests. Definitely something that's going to show up on this exam. Uh, and I would say probably on the magnitude of like three to five questions where you're doing some kind of chi-square distribution question um, in, in some capacity or F tests. Uh, so combining chi-squared and F tests, you're going to see probably three to five questions is my ballpark estimate. Um, again, feel free to comment below if you disagree, if you think it's more or less. Um, so first, I have the continuity correction. So specifically for binomial distribution approximation. Um, so if you are interested in the distribution of binomials, um, you can approximate it with normal. But the problem is if you are flipping a coin and you're interested in greater than 60 times and you use a normal approximation, well, what do you do with the area between 59 and 60? Um, and so you don't want to use that hard cutoff of 60. You want to split the difference and say, I'm going to uh, say I actually care about 59.5. So I, I say all this, this has shown up I think on two or three past exams and whether or not you did the correction you got the same answer. So up to this point it hasn't mattered but I could totally see them uh, saying that oh you got the question wrong because you didn't do the continuity correction because uh, Mahler included the continuity correction in his solution and I think it makes sense but I just thought I'd call that out. Next, the Fisher information is the negative expected value of the second derivative of the log likelihood um, and can be used for a lower bound on the variance of an estimator. Um, and <laughs> this is uh, definitely sketchy, but it typically works out to just one over the variance of the estimator is the Fisher information. It's not always the case, but um, I, if I see a Fisher information question on the exam, I'm probably just going to assume this because it typically works out to be the case. Um, so that's that bad math advice, but I, I think good test taking advice that that's probably going to be the case. Uh, we also have uh, sample variance versus some null hypothesis variance. Uh, you know, testing that out using a chi squared distribution. High likelihood of seeing one question on that. Um, also, a log likelihood ratio test, I 
definitely could expect to see one question on that as well. Uh, I think <laughs> maybe I'm conflating these, uh, but I, I, I feel like there's been at least one question every exam uh, on a, a you know row column table and you end up performing a chi-squared test, but I might be thinking of all of these as kind of the same thing and there's only one chi-square distribution test uh, per exam and you know in one exam it was this and one exam it was that um, but definitely going to see at least a few of these types of questions uh, and next the F table so just here is that table written out and uh, I have have another video where not for a, a model versus prediction but showing you how when you have uh, two sample variances you want to compare so actually what I have down here how that corresponds to an F test and you can see the similarities because the reason it's an F test or follows an F distribution is because it's the division of two chi-square distributions and chi-square distributions are just the sum of uh, squared normal zero ones and you get that by uh, normalizing by the degrees of freedom so a lot going on there but just knowing division of two chi-squareds it's going to follow an F distribution it gets you a long way uh, and random note uh, for this the larger variance according to the alternative hypothesis goes in the numerator and that's simply because that's all that we are provided in our tables because it's efficient to answer the question it wouldn't be wrong to take the inversion of this um, and then look at less than a specified F distribution value but we just don't have the tables for that provided to us so it's important to know to put the larger according to the alternative in the numerator in order to be able to use the F tables that were provided so <clears throat> again backing up high level uh, chi-squared and F test we're gonna see at least two questions I think on the exam uh, but probably closer to three to five next reliability uh, I love these questions. I think reliability questions are kind of similar to ACT type questions. You don't really need to know a lot. It's just you have to, you know, focus and not make stupid math mistakes as you walk through these problems. I, I will say the two things you do need to know are the terms minimal cut set and minimal path set. So definitely make sure you know these. They show up frequently and there's going to be at least two reliability questions on the exam probably more um, or I guess I can kind of blend them with Markov processes even though that's not totally right in my head but definitely anticipate at, at least one or two of these questions on the exam um, so there are those definitions next we have Markov processes um, so knowing that uh, really you, you need to know these terms because they'll use them and just assume you know what they mean then you have to you know draw out a Markov process and figure out what to do with it or um, they give you the transition matrix and then they say how many recurrent states are there or something like that there's going to be at least um, questions are going to require you to understand this material which way it goes whether it's they give you these terms and you have to do some math or they give you the transition matrix and then have to comment on these different states I'm not really sure um, but definitely know those it's worth understanding and uh, really what you absolutely need to know for these questions is just the steady state so <clears throat> that is whatever your current situation is multiplied by the transition matrix brings you right back to where you were um, so that's why this uh, is the steady state calculation um, so definitely need to know that it's going to be at least one question that uses that formula um, and I feel like that's pretty straightforward so it shouldn't be too hard to memorize likewise the uh, I didn't know where to put this I put it in the Markov chain process um, so this is <clears throat> if you have fair coin flips or unfair coin flips and you have some number of tokens and you won't stop until you have zero or you have n uh, what's the probability that you get down to zero and that's what these formulas calculate there will be one question on the exam that uses one of these two formulas I recommend knowing the unfair and uh, if it is a fair coin you can just plug in the values 0 0.4 9 9 9 9 9 9 9 and 5 point or 0 0.50001 
if you're desperate and you can't remember the simpler one. Um, although it's pretty straightforward, so it shouldn't be too hard to memorize. But definitely know this formula as well. Next, there are simulation questions. So I feel like there's always one inversion and one accept reject question. Um, so first off, inversion method, you have some distribution of interest. You know that the CDF range is from 0 to 1. So you can simulate a value in between 0 and 1 and then look at the CDF and what x does it correspond to. And that's your simulated x value. Um, so just showing that you can use a uniform to simulate all these different x values. So definitely know conceptually essentially what I just said and why that works um, and how to go through that. The other option is accept or reject. So I have some distribution uh, that's green. Um, I then simulate some other distribution that at least spans the same domain. Uh, so in this case, a uniform simulated from 0 to 1. The left to right distribution simulation doesn't have to be uniform. It can be any distribution. Um, <clears throat> so long as it can completely uh, always be over the green distribution when multiplied by a large enough factor. So we simulate from the blue distribution, which we know how to simulate from. And then what we do is simulate a random uniform. So this one, this one will always be random uniform, and that's simulating the y value. And then we're going to multiply it by some constant c. Um, so I simulated, you know, for this point, I simulated a 0.8 multiplied by 5 is 4. After having simulated a 0.6 from the uniform that I used to simulate left and right. And that is how you determine whether to accept or reject. So that second simulation value, uh, if multiplied by C, it is above the PDF, you're going to reject it. If it's below it, you accept it. And uh, just really quickly, if you want to know why would I use this method, um, it's when you can't easily invert um, a, a distribution. So if you can't invert the CDF, if you don't know how to, the formula doesn't allow you to. Um, to me, this is always the preferred method in application because uh, you just simulate a uniform and then you get out an x value, whereas this is computationally more expensive. Uh, you would just do this if, if you can't invert it. So anyways, uh, I would anticipate one of each of these techniques showing up on the exam. Uh, next, these two bullet points for principal components. Um, are totally random and I think it showed up on like one past exam question and it's almost not worth knowing in my personal opinion but I have it listed here which is just the sum of the squared loadings is equivalent to one and when you are calculating your principal components you're subtracting off the mean of your x's um, so I think there was some past question where they gave you all but one of the loadings for the first principal component they said solve for it and it's you needed to know that the sum of their squared values is equivalent to one to back into it. So I think that's a bit silly to have us memorize, but there it is. Next, uh, link function. So this was also uh, one specific question where you had to know that link functions need to be monotonic and differentiable. Uh, and they give you like four different random functions and you had to say which ones could be a link function if you wanted to. Uh, so I think that was one or two past questions, so not super important, but simple enough, so I included it here. Next, I think this has shown up at least once on every exam or almost all past exams, just knowing how when you have one variable of interest and you fit a linear regression, how do you do so? Uh, I think they've done it a few ways where they just give you the raw data or they give you, you know, sigma of x and y and they give you sigma of x and sigma of y and sigma x squared and all that and you had to know how to back into your intercept and your beta. <coughs> Finally, uh, I feel really comfortable with Lasso and Ridge. So on my personal cheat sheet, I don't have a lot um, written out for Lasso and Ridge, but definitely need to understand penalized regression. I think every past exam has had at least one question or has had one question on lasso and or ridge regression. So that's where you penalize your betas. Lasso is absolute value penalty. Ridge regression is squared uh, values for your parameter estimate penalties. So just knowing lasso is absolute value, ridge is squared, and they're penalized regression. So 
your betas are always going to be smaller using these methods versus the raw fit. Uh, next, time series. So I will admit time series is the one section I feel least comfortable on. So <laughs> still dreading eventually making videos for time series. Uh, what I can say is on every past exam, there has been a calculate the ACF question. This is guaranteed. You will see this question on the exam. It's happened every year or every six months. Um, so know that ACF is C sub K divided by C sub zero, and C sub K is one over N times this mess. Um, so this summation, let's say you have 10 observations and you're doing it for lag three. Uh, there's only gonna be, I think, seven calculations here, but you still divide by 10. So just wanna call out that N corresponds to the full data set, even though the amount of things you're summing together is gonna be less than N based off of what size lag you chose. So definitely know how to calculate the ACF. It will be on the exam, so know that. Uh, another random comment is that this upside down triangle of x2 is saying x2 minus x1. So I just have this written out uh, because I think when I read the question initially, when I was talking about taking the difference of two, uh, you know, the difference of the current versus the lag, um, I wasn't sure if it was like x3 minus x2 or x2 minus x1 um, or something like that. So this is random specific, not super important, but thought I'd call it out. Uh, and then finally, it's not shown over on the left because it's too long of a list, but I have notation or terminology. So just totally random things. Uh, lambda is average frequency per unit of time, and then theta is average time until first event. And this gets at the relationship between Poisson and exponential. Next, we have this n notation, uh, which just corresponds to a specific time interval. So uh, it was a one past exam question it said, what is the expected frequency of a Poisson distribution for N1 and N2? And N2 is greater than or equal to N1 because they correspond to the same time window. Uh, so that's just notation that you needed to know. And uh, I thought the question was easy once you understood that, but got the question wrong because uh, I didn't know this notation. Uh, next, this caret symbol just means the minimum value of these two. So you can think of, for insurance, if you have uh, limits and you're not willing to pay any more than X number of dollars. And then finally, bandwidth. Uh, so kernel density estimation is another topic that is on every past exam, I believe. Um, so need to know how to use kernel estimation uh, and to know that bandwidth means the radius, not the overall width uh, for a given point estimation. So that covers all of the topics. Um, really appreciate you if you made it to the end of this very long video. Hopefully it wasn't totally useless rambling. Um, comment below if there's any thoughts you have or uh, different formulas you think are definitely important to know that I missed. Really made this video to hopefully help everyone else who uh, are, is potentially cramming for MAS1 or you know, maybe it's six months before the next sitting and you just want to get a high level understanding of the topics that could be covered. Um, so really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch this video. Comment below, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Uh, and until next time, have a good one.